Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of React Native Radio. Today, joining you is me, Tim, and James as well on our panel. Hey guys. Um, our guest today is Michael Michael uh, Lefkowitz. Hey Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Awesome. Uh, if you want to introduce yourself to our guest and kind of just you know give us a little background on yourself, please feel free. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Michael Lefkowitz, uh, software engineering manager at a startup out in Austin, Texas called Lawn Starter. Um, and I'm here to mainly chat about today uh, on the side. I've been running for the last year or so a React Native newsletter called uh, React Native Now. Early in my career, I figured out which jobs were worth working at and which ones weren't, mostly by trial and error. I created a system that I used to find jobs and later contracts as a freelancer. If you're looking for a job or trying to figure out where you should go next, then check out my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. The book walks you through figuring out what you want, vetting companies that meet your criteria, meeting that company's employees, and getting them to recommend you for a job. Don't settle for whoever has listed their job on the job board. Go out and proactively find the job you'll love. Buy the book at devchat.tv slash job book. That's devchat.tv slash job book. Awesome. I'm actually a subscriber to React Native now. Um, I have been for a while. To be honest with you, I can't even totally off the top of my head remember when or how I originally <laughs> found out about the newsletter. But um, but no, yeah, it's always shown up in my inbox because um, it's bi-weekly. And mm -hmm. I've always really enjoyed the content. I always thought um, it's, it's kind of hard to actually dig for relevant React Native content. And there's, there's so many React-specific newsletters that kind of already exist. Um, so I thought this one was especially good, um, always has relevant articles that I actually look forward to. That's very good to hear. Yeah, so, what's one thing I don't think I uh, get enough of is kind of um, user feedback and I've been thinking about that a little bit and recently and how I can kind of solicit um, maybe like a forum or something to get a little feedback about different articles. But um, yeah, I mean, anecdotally hearing people like it is, is, is good enough for me at the moment. Awesome. Um, and I guess I just, I, I have so many questions about like newsletters in general, uh, especially because this one focuses on React Native and just, um, I almost don't know where to dive into specifically. So I guess kind of with the backstory, maybe um, just taking it all the way to the very beginning, you know, what inspired you to begin the newsletter? And how did you even start digging into something like that? Sure. Um, so the backstory of the newsletter, um, there's actually even a further backstory from, from what I know, um, but it's kind of changed hands over the last couple of years, um, which uh, from what I've seen is a, is a relatively common thing in, in the industry when things get a little bit of uh, traction. Um, I've seen on other newsletters, um, but at least from my, my point of the story that I can definitely comment on uh, was about exactly a year ago. Um, I, I had been a subscriber to a different React Native uh, newsletter um, called Let's React. Um, and I had written an article personally, um, I think for either for my company blog, uh, about, uh, some react native stuff that we were working on as our team. Um, and so one of my articles got published in this newsletter and, um, the, the author of it, Kenza Iraqi, um, and I, I apologize if Kenza's listening and I butchered her name. Uh, I don't, I think we've only ever communicated over Twitter DMs. Um, but she had reached out to me, um, and kind of said, Hey, I featured your, your article. I just want to let you know. So that was pretty exciting and started kind of following her. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, um, she had kind of put out a post that she was looking for somebody to take over every other issue. Uh, cause, cause she had a couple other things that were more pressing in her time. Um, so I reached out and, you know, said I was interested and, uh, at the time for me, it worked out really well because uh, at my company, I had shifted away from my kind of day-to-day -day React Native work um, to support our backend infrastructure and uh, was needing a little bit of extra help. Um, we, had, we had lost one of our devs that had been on the team for a while. Um, so, so my days were, were filled with a lot of uh, PHP and Laravel, which uh, wasn't as nearly as exciting to me as, as the stuff that I had done previously in React Native. And so when that opportunity came up, it kind of, it kind of sold me because it was a chance to, you know, 
pay, keep paying attention to the industry, um, keep paying attention to what's going on in the framework, even though uh, there was a short break for me working on it day to day. So I took that opportunity, said I'd be interested, um, started uh, kind of switching off issues with her and did that for a short while. Um, and then, uh, you know, we kind of made a, a pact to one another if, if one of us was busy and had life happen that, you know, the other one would step up and kind of do a double issue. Um, and then uh, that's kind of what happened is you know, she, she had other things that, that took over her time and uh, kind of had lost interest in it. And so she, she asked if I was interested in formally taking over um, the newsletter at that point. Um, so I, I jumped into that. Um, didn't want it to tie too much. I believe she has a, uh, you know, kind of a meetup and a consulting group of the same name. So I didn't want to keep that t entangled too much. So change the name to React Native now. Um, and that's kind of where uh, where it kicked off for for the last year. Awesome. Yeah. No. That's that's actually kind of interesting. I guess you're right that there's a lot of things in in the industry that just kind of um, have like a lineage that gets passed down through various people and stuff. And in a lot of ways, this podcast, just me being the host on, is kind of like that too. Um, you know, and I also relate to your whole point about how it's just a good way to keep up with what's going on in the industry. Um, mm -hmm. Because even like me hosting on this podcast and stuff too, I just, in a lot of ways, um, for listeners, I don't know if they know this, but um, the hosts are just volunteer, we're not paid or anything. Um, so, but yeah, to me, it's always been like a really good way to just kind of like keep up and meet people essentially, um, which is cool. Absolutely. So, what what kind of like just to for viewers who aren't familiar with the newsletter can you kind of give an, maybe an overview of what kind of content uh someone who's receiving the newsletter could expect to see in it sure um so i kind of adopted a little bit of the same uh, overall structure as uh you know the, the newsletter has historically had um which is a mix of news um and news can be anything from sort of the you know major changes within the framework or major releases within the framework or major releases with you know what I would consider some of the like core third party libraries um, such as react navigation or such um, and then other news that crops up a lot that I'm particularly interested in um, is when like there's a lot of major companies um, that either you know have some sort of news either if it's positive or negative with the framework and they're moving towards it or away from it um, I always find that uh, really exciting to highlight. Um, aside from that, um, you know, as with most newsletters, I think, uh, tutorials, um, I specifically would say that most of the tutorials are either a very niche subject um, or geared towards a little bit more of the intermediate to uh, advanced user. Um, and, you know, that's just... Um, I guess that's a personal interest. Um, it's kind of the content that I'm interested in. It's what I look for. Um, and I think there's tons and tons of great tutorials uh, and great lessons out there um, for beginners. And, I, and I'm, I'm excited that people continue to put out that content. Um, but there's certainly a lot of overlap on that. And I you know, don't want to bore readers with, with the same things every week. And then uh, kind of a collection of some of the uh, more popular third-party libraries that have cropped up over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, those can be anything from a, a really, really well-designed app that's worth looking at the source code to get a sense of how they did that uh, to um, just a, just some really cool um, helper libraries or component libraries, anything like that. Um, we'll occasionally throw in some videos. Again, try to pay attention to um, things that are like more unique. Um, you know, not not something that you'd necessarily find if you're if you're following the the typical uh, React Native threads uh, on on different social media. Try to find something a little bit more uh, in depth, um, and that's the that's kind of the overall concept here and there. I'll throw in um, some mixes of different design resources that are interesting, um, different things that maybe just tie back to the overall JavaScript or React ecosystem or programming as a whole that just um, kind of sparked my interest over the last couple of weeks. But those are the, those are the core topics that we, we cover. That's really interesting. I am, I have to confess, I am not yet a subscriber. Obviously, as soon as it finishes, I'm straight <laughs> on that. Where can I subscribe? Sure. Uh, ReactNativeNow.com. Awesome. I'm 
immediately there as soon as it finishes. Uh, it sounds yeah. super involved, man. Like, how much time are you putting into producing this? Is every two weeks, you say? Yeah, so it's every two weeks. Um, here and there might push it to three. Um, that's something that I, I try and also, you know, I'm barely aware of. I don't want to, I don't want to set myself on a forced biweekly schedule if I don't think that there's enough good content to ship out. Um, and I don't want to ship something out that's too light uh, or too heavy. So two weeks is typically how things fall. Um, but, um, you know, like it's, in my opinion, it's still um, compared to like we were talking about different React newsletters or whatnot. Um, it's still a little bit more of a, a, a slightly niche subsect of the overall React and JavaScript ecosystem. Um, so there isn't as much content. So I don't want to just, you know, throw it out to put it out. Uh, but, but yeah, we're, we're, otherwise it's, uh, it's uh, bi-weekly and I'd say for time, um, probably all in each one probably takes me about uh, an hour and a half, two hours to compile. Um, I'll spend the two to three weeks, you know, making notes of, uh, like adding bookmarks, adding likes, things that I'll just kind of be personal bookmarks for me to reference back later. Um, and then, uh, kind of do my real deep dive and build on the issue, um, in about like a day or so leading up to the release. Oh, that's cool. It sounds like it's a quality over content sort of situation, which sounds perfect. Um, so you do all of the work collating the information and you basically handpick all the most interesting stuff over the last couple of weeks about React Native and then mail it out. Is that the basic gist? That's the basic gist. Um, awesome. I guess the only, the only exception to that is when people share things with me and then, you know, I appreciate that because then they're helping me out, but that's, um, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a little more rare. <laughs> That's cool. So uh, it's like a curated list, I suppose, that you've, you've put together. Do you have to write or any sort of original content to go with it, or do you mainly pull from uh, existing blogs and stuff that are already out there? Sure. Um, no, occasionally, um, you know, writing blogs and tutorials is also an interest of mine, and I, I get the opportunity to do that um, in my free time and, and sometimes uh, in my, my work time as well. Um, so, you know, certainly if I put something out there that's related, I'll use the opportunity to share it. Um, but, uh, I'd say, you know, most, most every issue is all, um, is all user, other users contributing, um, not necessarily mine. I'll add, uh, you know, my own little summary of, of the read, um, uh, maybe like an introductory paragraph if something really big is going on in the ecosystem. Um, but for the most part, it's, uh, you know, just a, a series of links and kind of my, my feedback on those links. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if you're doing a, a full-time job on the side of this it's a lot it's a lot of extra work to start putting stuff together it's cool yeah. that you can launch your own blog stuff from it though it's a really nice platform to do that i guess absolutely yeah yeah it gives uh, it gives me a you know a little bit of a, a readership boost in in things that i write about and i particularly like i said only really write about things that um are, are would fall into that category of stuff that i would want to submit to other readers anyway so it works out that way that's cool. How do you go about sort of aggregating stuff and what are the sort of top areas you check out? I mean, bearing in mind, I'll be subscribed any day now. So like, there's no need for me to look at these either because I can get it from you. But where do you like checking out this kind of information? Sure. Um, so yeah, like I said, we've got a, I got a Google form at reactnativenow.com slash submit. Um, so that's one source. Uh, aside from that, kind of top stuff for me, um, I look through the uh, like React Native content on Dev.2 or the Practical Dev. I'm not sure exactly how they you know brand themselves when you when you speak about them. Um, I look through Medium. Uh, I'm a little wary sometimes on Medium because uh, I try to avoid sharing stuff that are paywalled, um, just because I think it's an annoying user experience to have to to deal with. But sometimes there is really great content still that pops up on Medium. Um, <laughs> I'll look through Reddit. Um, a big one definitely is going through Twitter and whether that's um, articles or um, even just Twitter threads from React Native maintainers um, or people who are you know, kind of highlighted in the community. Sometimes that stuff is, is really exciting to share. Um, I'll do a search on YouTube for new videos. Um, and then I'll kind of look through, as I mentioned, I'll look through GitHub um, and look through different either projects that have been created in the last uh, couple of weeks or ones that have received like a, a high increase in kind of star and light count um, and try to find different open source um, packages that I can, I can share through that as well.
Back when functional programming was making its resurgence, I found it really interesting that a lot of people were moving over there and it almost felt like it was on hype. And I didn't really understand the power of functional programming until I learned Elixir. Elixir is a functional programming language. It's built on the Erlang virtual machine and it really does some interesting things and makes you build apps in a different way. But what's really fascinating about it is the speed of the applications, the ability to distribute work easily, and just how it manages the functional programming and all of the nice things about it so that you don't have to worry about side effects and a lot of the other things that come out of functional programming. Plus, pattern matching in Elixir is a killer feature. If you're looking for a new language that you want to learn that is going to make a difference for you and give you the opportunity to challenge some of your thinking and find a new way of doing it, Elixir is a great way to go. And we have a podcast now on Elixir called Elixir Mix. And you can find that at elixirmix.com. In a given episode or a sort of a given issue, I should say, have you come across articles that are diametrically opposed to each other? And maybe you're thinking you're going to mention something and then you find somebody else has completely disagreed with it. Do you put them both out or has that just never happened? Um, the only one that I can particularly think of um, is, you know, when I, I, I obviously, like I was saying, I like sharing stuff about how companies are excited to use React Native and whatnot. Um, the big one that pops up every once in a while are people's opinions on the React Native versus Flutter debate. Um, and I'd say those are the, <laughs> that's the really only one that I, I often see and I can think of that have the uh, like complete opposite opinions. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to share things that are, you know, put it in a bad light if it deems necessary. Um, or if people prevent, uh, you know, or present a really compelling case on why they, you know, chose one framework or the, over the other. Um, but you know, a, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff turns out to be noise. Um, and it's kind of rehashing the same subjects um, and kind of going over some maybe basic differences, which is not really um, interesting in my opinion. People cannot get enough of trashing other people's frameworks. This comes sure. up like almost every week, this comes up. It's like, it's React or it's Angular or it's Native or it's Flutter. Um, is React Native the best library? Um, well, <laughs> I think React Native is absolutely <laughs> the best library for on, on a couple of things um it's the best library if you are a javascript developer looking to get into mobile um yeah, i think it's the absolutely. best library if you are a company with um you know relatively limited resources and you want to make the most of your engineering team and if you have a web development um, and front-end engineering team and they want to get into mobile apps then you don't have to necessarily um, spend a lot of money on hiring iOS devs and Android devs. Um, and there's a ton to be saved for the business case for it. On the web, though, um, I personally haven't used anything like React Native Web, but I think the idea of creating this one unified code base is incredible. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, so that's kind of my opinion on the, the mobile side. Um, I actually love using Vue on the web. So um, that's, that's where I leave. you. I've not mm -hmm. played about with Vue enough yet. Um, I hear it's pretty good. I mean, I, I came into React Native from a React background. And while I have a plethora of React work available to me, I'm not learning any new libraries. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, I think Vue is worth looking at from what I've heard. But mm -hmm. uh, I probably shouldn't be saying that here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interestingly, um, a lot of the stuff that we do at Exhibition Blizzard is like the whole, we have like this whole MyCod experience, which is actually written in Vue. Um, so we have some advocates for that there. And it seems really cool. So one of the developers who used to do Vue 2 um, jumped teams over to our team um, to do React Native with us too. So he brings a lot of the expertise um, or like thoughts about Vue to conversations, which is cool too. But sure. not to detour too much on the Vue, but yeah, it is, it is actually an interesting framework. So, so yeah, I definitely, you know, speaking about all the different content and stuff, it's, it's, it is super interesting seeing so many different um, things, you know, it, it really is diverse. I've been kind of flipping through old issues just to remember how diverse it is. And like, really you do, you pull from a lot, like you'll have links from Twitter, um, actual company websites. Um, I, I really do like the open source section and just how many different things that you've managed to find in like a two week period. Um, and that really is just highlighting different people's work in super cool ways. Um, you know, and then like videos and everything. So, I mean, that's always been my favorite part. And it's just kind of like, 
blows my mind that like I feel like I'm someone who's actually like trying to go out of his way to like find React Native content throughout my week, and like you clearly find much more than I can find in that amount of time, even when I'm trying. <laughs> so good work on that. Um, but I guess I'm kind of curious: has there has there been any content that you remember featuring? that really stood out to you a lot or, or maybe has like a fun backstory or something to it? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, that's a hard question too, I'll admit. I don't know. I'm going to put you on the spot with that one. Um, yeah, I, I can't think of anything that necessarily has a, a, a fun backstory. Um, the stuff that I actually really do appreciate and what I um, get a lot of, uh, you know, personal uh, joy from is when I do, when I do share somebody's article uh, and then I'll typically um, kind of follow up and, and as I said, my, my predecessor kind of taught me this um, and I'll follow up and try and leave a comment on the, the blog or the article to, if, if there's an opportunity to do so and let them know, Hey, I featured this in this article. Um, and it's really exciting to see when, um, you know, d different developers will then share on Twitter and, and tag us and say, Hey, like, this is so exciting. My, my stuff got featured and, um, you know, this is the first article I wrote and now it's like starting to gain a little traction. And, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's fun when, you know, obviously hearing feedback from, from readers on what they like to read. Um, but also hearing feedback from, um, the actual, you know, original content creators and, and getting excited that their stuff got a little bit more traction from me. Actually. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, I was already subscribed to the newsletter, but one of the ways that me and you actually started talking a little more, you know, you started showing up on radar a little more, um, is you featured an article I had written, um, it was titled working on the call of duty companion app. It was just like a review of my work I had done over the last year. And randomly one day, um, I was like, oh, I actually, I saw it in the newsletter because you left a comment on the blog post saying you featured it, but I saw the newsletter hit my inbox um, and I saw it like I had like woken up and like I was pretty like sleepy laying in bed or something and I was like scrolling through because I'll do a quick scroll and be like, I won't read all the articles like when I first look at it, I'll do like a quick scroll and be like, oh, see if there's anything I'm going to want to read later and then like remember to revisit it and I'm scrolling through mm -hmm. and then I see like this big picture of, of the app I work on and I was like, Ah, that's me. Um, and, and that was actually a pretty dope feeling. Um, it felt really good. So that's definitely one of my favorite things about the newsletter is like, I imagine like you're bringing that feeling to lots of different um, developers and React Native who are blogging and, and it is exciting and it does kind of motivate people to want to try to do that more often, which is cool. Absolutely. Yeah. And now, now that you bring it up, this will be, this will be the new fun backstory, right? This is uh yeah, I guess I'll sharing I'll, I guess that story to that. ending up on the podcast. This is the this is the, probably the best one so far. Cool. Yeah. No, I wasn't trying to to, to insert that. That wasn't a <laughs> secret plan or anything. But uh, happy if that's the case. So, so one hot topic lately um, that's kind of come up more and more. Um, you know, the unfortunate situation is some developers have been laid off lately. Um, due to, you know, global circumstances. And I know people are actually out, you know, looking for jobs again. Um, and one thing that I think, you know, the React Native Now is a force for good for is that you do have, you know, job highlights in it sometimes. Um, so in a way, it, it can be a way for people to keep, keep up to date with what's going on. Um, so if you want to speak to that a little bit and just what you do to highlight jobs, um, and what people can look for, feel free. Sure. Um, yeah, if anybody uh, out there is um, is, is hiring, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we've, we've got a spot for a featured job. We've got a spot for a featured listing. Um, and occasionally, we've had a couple things posted with that. Um, and I'm happy to, to share. Um, and aside from that, um, occasionally, every once in a while, I'll, I'll share a link to a lot of little side project that I spun up when I was um, toying around with learning static site generation, which was reactnativejobs.com. Um, and that was, that's kind of the same concept um, was, you know, right now it's, it's aggregating data from Indeed about different React Native um, jobs available. Uh, and then we have a submission feature, which um, ideally, if, if anybody wants to just kind of tack onto that, instead of getting it in a biweekly newsletter, be able to kind of feature your job on a, a resource for React Native developers um, specifically. Uh, that's something that I hadn't really seen 
um, much of in the market. Um, I uh, actually came up with the idea um, when, as I was mentioned before, working with uh, Laravel a little bit, um, and I had Googled Laravel jobs in, in intention of looking for their actual like job system within Laravel, the framework. Uh, and the first result that popped up was, I believe, LaravelJobs.com, and it was a aggregator of different jobs for Laravel devs. Um, and I hadn't seen anything like that for React Native devs and um, wanted to play around with static site generation. So I put that together, and uh, I hope that'll continue to, to be a resource for people as well. That sounds cool. Do you do uh, international job ad advertisements or advertisements? So I should learn to speak before doing this. Yeah. Yeah, um, we actually had, this was about uh, maybe a few months ago, um, had a firm from the UK uh, who, who placed a job ad within the newsletter. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good to get some uh, European roles on there as well in that case, because I guess the uh, listenership spreads out from across the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty wide um, range of different uh, readers. Um, so I kind of, you know, shared that information with the uh, the firm from the UK, and they were um, happy to to throw their listing on. So I I haven't followed up with them, but I hope things worked out. That's cool. So I guess a couple of follow ups to that, which is um, how have you been finding or seeing the job market in the last sort of ten weeks specifically? And prior to that, how have you seen the job market around the React Native side, or indeed any part of the job market in this sort of sphere? Have you seen that grow or shrink over the last, as long as you've been doing the uh, newsletter? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think as, as with everybody, I think the job market is definitely tightening right now. Um, I'm optimistic that um, as we've seen in past uh, recessions, that a lot of great companies will be formed from this and um, you know, we'll see some, some big stuff in the future, but there's certainly a tightening yeah. out there. Um, and there's a lot of really, really, really talented devs who are getting laid off from some high profile positions. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more, uh, aggressive and a tight market, uh, for those that are looking, um, in regards to react native, um, I don't feel like I've seen too much of a shift, at least in the past, you know, few months. Uh, in COVID related items, um, at, at least the way that I've kind of seen it over the last um, few years that I've been working with the framework is, uh, as I mentioned, I, I think it's still, it's still relatively niche in the JavaScript ecosystem. Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. And I, and I think that's the real challenge for devs who are looking to work in React Native is that um, a, a lot of companies, I believe, are Either, either going down the path of, hey, we've decided on React Native because um, you know, we hired, brought someone on and they're interested in it. Um, so we're looking for those more experienced React Native devs to come in and help build out our app. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of that. I don't think there is nearly enough um, opportunities for those who are looking to get the professional experience with the framework, um, who have the fully fledged out application and are now saying, you know, we want to hire on some either more junior devs or more senior devs who just don't have experience with the framework. Um, I personally haven't seen a lot of that. And I think that's something that'll change over time. Um, and as you start to see more companies adopting it, um, and as the framework matures a little bit more, uh, you know, there, there's certainly those opportunities will open, but um, I don't believe from what I've seen, there's been a, a big shift in that, in that kind of numbers in the last few, couple of years. Yeah. I, anecdotally, I would say that I, I'm frequently getting calls from recruiters with React roles and, uh, you know, other JavaScript frameworks as well, but I specifically put myself out as a React dev and the React native roles are far fewer. I, one every month or two maybe comes in. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely agree with that assessment. Uh, as you say, though, the companies are starting to move more and more. We had um, Shopify in a few weeks ago, and they're moving by the sounds of it fully to React Native. They're having really good results from it. But um, mm. one of the companies I'm working with at the moment, their entire app part of their ecosystem is already, you know, it's native. So I think it's uh, Kotlin. Uh, most of it's in, um, and they've got no plans to move anytime soon. Yep. And, and well, the one thing that, you know, could at least be hopeful for people is uh, the shift that we're now seeing in companies who are embracing remote policies. Um, and you mentioned Spot, uh, Shopify and 
Um, I did see their their CEO uh, about a couple of weeks ago announced that they are going to move into a remote first culture. Um, and you know, I've always been personally really interested in the stuff that uh, Shopify does with React Native and some of their open source stuff. But uh, you know, a lot of their jobs have always been um, you know international uh, or whatnot. And um, so I think with the the shift in remote culture and and what this kind of pandemic has has caused. Um, there may be more opportunities opening up for people who, you know, for different companies who are kind of opening up their talent pool. Absolutely. I, I, it, the pandemic has been truly awful, obviously, but when it starts to come out the other side, it will be really interesting to see what kind of positives can come from this. And I think remote working could be one of them. And now that it's demonstrated that it, it really does work, um, because it, it's had to work. And I think people have had to learn a lot of new skills in order to do that. So the team I work with, some of the work we've been doing, absolutely smashing it. It's been working really well. But there's parts like a project kickoff where normally you'd be in the same room and you'd point at pieces of paper and pictures and stuff. It's so difficult to replicate that online. And I think that probably companies coming up with solutions to specifically that kind of problem, I think they're going to do well over the next 12 months, let's say. I think we'll start to see stuff like that, um, which will be really interesting. And being able to do a remote role from anywhere in the world that would be interesting as well. I mean, time zones permitting. But I think, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing those opportunities come up sometime, hopefully, in the next year or so. Yeah, absolutely. That'll be the big, um, I think, shift and, and you know, we'll kind of define which companies are able to succeed in the remote culture is um, the ones that will either fully transition to remotes that you won't really have that, um, you know, kind of in between where some people are in office and some aren't and they may feel excluded um, or companies who figure out unique ways to, resolve that. Um, like I, I read about, uh, I believe Spotify has a policy where when you're actually having meetings, even if you are in house, that you're actually setting up your webcam and you're connecting to a meeting, um, you know, mm -hmm. as an individual and everybody is an individual within this meeting. And then they can kind of, you know, people who are in and house can then collaborate after and go out for coffee or whatnot. Um, but it makes everybody feel more inclusive. I think that's the absolute killer point in this is that it works when everybody's either in a room together or they're all remote. It doesn't work when half the team's in and half the team isn't. So, yeah, that is a shift that I guess some companies are going to be employing over the uh, near future. Many of you have probably heard about App Store optimization and how it can help you get more downloads. There's a lot of demand for apps right now, so it's a really great time to give it a try. It's easier than you think. The folks at App Figures have easy step-by-step -step guides and intuitive tools, which many indie developers are using to get more downloads. The guys who run it are indie devs who have a need and created the tool. 11 years later, it's an all-in-one platform for developers who want to get more downloads and make more money with their apps. Try App Figures for free, and if you like it, you can use our special code RNR3030 to get 30% off for the next three months. Yeah, definitely. It'll be interesting to watch where everything goes and Kind of just looping back, I've been having some thoughts too on, on just this whole topic of React Native jobs and stuff and just listening to you guys. And I guess some of my thoughts are just that it is complicated. Um, like even when I've, I'm happy where I'm at, so I'm not going anywhere or anything. But like when I have like looked around at like stuff and seen stuff online, um, it's it's hard. Job descriptions are kind of cryptic cryptic sometimes because usually jobs that are actually going to be React Native end up saying um, React Native is in like the bonus to have stuff at the bottom. Um, a lot of it comes off as like looking like there might be native focus because they mention Android and iOS um, as like the core requirements, and then um, you kind of can't tell sometimes. Um, it's such a weird hybrid of different skills that they expect you to have that like I I can't even begin to fathom for me personally what it would be like to have to like you know wade through different LinkedIn job postings or something like that to figure out is this a React Native job because most of them don't just come out and say it in the title they don't say React Native developer it's usually like mobile engineer iOS Android or, or something to that effect um so that was a lot of why I really liked reactnativejobs.com because I feel like people can trust like blatantly like, oh, okay, I know I'm getting a React Native job posting here um, to, to look at. So it you know, cuts to the chase and removes all the cryptic aspects of trying to hunt down those different job postings. Um, 
And just on this whole topic too, in general, just some of my advice to people, if you're out there listening and you are trying to look for a job, two of my jobs I got, I got through LinkedIn and it was people reaching out to me. And I actually got to sit down and talk to like a coach at one point, like a, it was like a job coach from Amazon who talked about how the best way to get jobs and stuff. Um, and one of those is really just take the time to fill out your LinkedIn. If you guys want, go to my LinkedIn, Tim Jung, and look at how I filled it out because it's not a resume. Your focus is supposed to be on storytelling, actually. That's what makes recruiters stick around. And obviously, you want to like hit the right keywords and stuff, too. So you actually show, show up in searches and everything. Um, but really taking the time to fill it out and, and stuff it increases like if you'll show up in search results and increases um, it's like your credibility essentially. So that's, that to me just, it just goes a long way. I think people, people often underrate LinkedIn because it's kind of like this like dead social. I mean, it's not, it's, a, it's an alive social media platform, but in a lot of ways it kind of feels like a ghost town at the same time, which is weird. Um, but there are recruiters on there actively going through stuff. So um, yeah, definitely. Definitely just be on top of that. And that's that's part of why networking in general is good too and why I think people like go write a blog post and then submit it to Michael here and try to get it featured in the newsletter because you know that those are talking points in interviews and stuff that set you above other people um, that are worth doing. So Absolutely. I know I'm getting off the topic of the newsletter a little bit, but I just know um, like recently we asked for some questions from listeners um, and – we haven't at this time gotten enough to do like a full blown community potluck. Um, but one of the questions was, you know, give us some details on the react native job market. Um, and I feel like, yeah, it was, it was worth detouring for a second to talk about that because that's an issue that I know people are experiencing right now in the middle of this pandemic. So great. Is there anything else about the newsletter, uh, Michael, that we didn't get to highlight for you? I guess the only other thing I'd say is uh, I, I could think of is, you know, there's, there's definitely other React Native newsletters out there. Um, and if you are a subscriber to any of those, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll, one thing I, I'm a subscriber to all the other ones too. Um, there's, and I, I try and avoid things that have been shared before. Um, and you know really trying to like pay attention to that kind of stuff too so it, it isn't it definitely don't want to make it feel like you have to choose one and i'm very supportive of anybody else putting together um their own newsletter or the ones that exist ever already and i i don't make it like a, a competition it's just something that um i enjoy doing and um i you know like the to share unique content so if you if you aren't a subscriber and you're worried about being subscribed to two uh, I'd encourage you to at least check us out. And um, I think we'll, you'll find some unique content that you weren't expecting. I think that's awesome. Um, and that's a lot of why I thought it was super cool to have you on the podcast too, is because in a lot of ways we kind of are a small community, um, especially like when it comes to like blog posts and like who's doing what and all these things. Um, and really like, you know, the old saying, like a rising tide lifts all boats. And, and that's really the case for, for your newsletter, for the podcast, for the other newsletters. Um, the more that we work together to, you know, bolster this community, um, you know, everyone wins. It means more jobs for people in the long run. It means uh, more people contributing to React Native. So, that's super awesome. Um, I even think on your point of you mentioned that you try to pay attention to them so you don't have too much overlap. I'd even go as far as saying like, yeah, have the overlap because for me, I don't subscribe to any other newsletter. So I'm like, yeah, I don't want to miss anything. So I, I, I wouldn't even feel bad about that because in a lot of ways, um, I've seen stuff that you're like, I was flipping through the old posts right now and I noticed that you had um, one on an article about how uh, react native was used for light os and that was um we had the guest on for that too i can't remember his name off the top of my head if i dug for it i could find it but um i think that overlap is good in a lot of ways because it just means that you know these things get amplified more and more which is cool absolutely james if you didn't have anything else um we can move on to our picks yeah i think i think that's everything i mean um we've asked all about your favorite content that you've had in there 
I guess if there's nothing else that really stands out that you'd love to tell us about, then I think we're good. Yeah, I, I can't I can't think of anything. I'm looking forward this... to subscribing. I think it's going to be nice to read some stuff about it. I think go go be that one true newsletter. Copy all of the other content, put it all into yours. Be like this is this is the one stop shop. This is what you yeah. need. Uh, no, I I genuinely appreciate each and every subscriber. Um, you know, I'll check. What's your uh, subscriber count? I never asked you. Oh, that's how many are you getting? Um, we are just at about. I believe we're just at about uh, two thousand now. Nice. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I genuinely appreciate every time people subscribe. Obviously, it's you know, it usually comes when uh, something, uh, an issue comes out is kind of where the biggest flux is. Um, and to that point too, I even you know, I even appre- like I even really pay attention to those that that unsubscribe. And uh, aside from ones that just bounce on emails, you know, when people, I, I wish I could get more feedback of why on the occasional unsubscribe. Um, uh, the, the, you know, there's a little bit of a, a reason drop down and some people say not interested or none given, whatever, and that's fine. Um, and I wish I could get more information. I think the one that just personally doesn't make sense to me is uh, occasionally people mark it as uh, sends too many emails. And as far as I know, it's, you know, I promised you uh, bi-weekly and I, I stick to that. So if you, if you think you're getting too many, then you, you signed yourself up for that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a it's a dark flutter conspiracy. That's why people are, <laughs> people are unsubscribing. But great. Um, yeah, for real, people should subscribe. The content is actually very good. Um, but on that note, we can move on to our picks for the week. Uh, for users who do not know, picks are just part of the show where we can bring a little personality to the episode by highlighting something that uh, maybe has been interesting to us or that we've been doing lately. Um, so for me, I'll kick off the picks. Um, I don't know when this recording is going to air necessarily, um, but right now things in the United States are pretty heated, um, rightfully and justifiably. So um, my personal stance is Black Lives Matter. Um, and it's important right now that we highlight diversity, um, educate ourselves about what's going on and be forces of good in, in the fight against racism. So my pick this week is kind of uh, is serious in tone and um, it's, it's kind of atypical from what we would normally pick, but basically it's a Google document titled Anti-Racism Resources for White People. I'm a white person personally. So to me, in a lot of ways, I don't know the struggle that black people have to experience the United States. Um, so, but it's my personal responsibility as a white person to educate myself and understand those struggles so I can be a good ally. So please, if you're listening, um, it's your personal responsibility um, as an American, as a citizen of the globe to understand these things and get better. So the resource has lots of good stuff in it. Um, it has books, it has podcasts, it has articles, um, videos, movies, film, TV. So really, if someone could go in here and just pick out one thing and just, just get your feet wet by spending 10 minutes on one of these things to just enrich your life a little more, uh, I would super appreciate that and that is worth doing. So now t- I'll s- toss over to you guys. You don't have to have a series of a pick, don't worry. Um, we can... We can have a lighter tone, but I, I did need to address that. So that's well said, Tim. I think that's really good. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Um, yeah, I'd love to a, have a serious one as well. But uh, uh, this week, uh, we're still in lockdown. I've got more games. I feel like this is really changing the tone. But uh, I'll lighten it up. I've been playing a lot of Jackbox games, which are online games that you can play with uh, other people. Uh, you share a screen. And then there's games like Drawful, which is like a Pictionary style clone. And you use uh, your device of your choice to do some drawing on. Uh, There's games like Fibbage, um, which is a sort of Call My Bluff style game. And it's just, it's lovely, entertaining, fun, nice way to spend an evening while you're stuck inside if you're still self-isolating, which over in the UK, we still are doing. Highly recommend. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for picking something that's a little lighter in tone too, but uh, <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and uh, Michael, what are your sick picks for the week? Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's a tough one to follow. Um, but I'll try and stay on topic uh, slightly. Um, my, you know, during our quarantine, uh, my wife and I have been watching, uh, trying to go through some cult classics that uh, neither of us had seen before. 
Um, and so uh, one of the ones that I liked the most recently was They Live. Uh, it's a John Carpenter film from 1988. Um, and it's still got a bunch of themes that are very relevant today. Um, from consumerism, commercialism, um, advertising manipulation, government control. Um, and it's a, it's a really, really fun film. Um, and, you know, one thing that was exciting for me was it looking, watching it and I immediately recognized it, it sparked the Andre the Giant has a posse campaign that, uh, Shepard Ferry made famous through, uh, his Obey company. Um, so that's really the, the, the core and where that started. Um, so I think, you know, staying slightly on topic, a lot of those themes are, are very relevant today and uh, it's a great film. Awesome. Did you have any uh, other picks or anything that you wanted to talk about too? Because you're allowed to have more than one if you want to. So, sure. The only other one I thought of was uh, adding to the other things that I've been doing in quarantine is um, learning different uh, two-player games um, to play with my wife. And uh, we we borrowed a cribbage set from a neighbor recently, uh, and I'd never learned how to play cribbage before. Um, and I wanted to get some practice in uh, on playing on you know on my phone. Um, So I did a search for it and I came across this game called Cribbage with Grandpas. Um, And it was like an Apple featured game of the week, uh, maybe about a year ago or so. Um, And it's very fun. It's got it's 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 a really lovely like design and creative app um, where you're effectively playing cribbage with a a, a grandpa that you've designed. Um, And he kind of communicates with you and, you know, tells you you're doing great during it. Um, and to me, it's, it's kind of got that special feeling of a unique app that doesn't always exist. And there's a million apps out there that could have easily just been a website, um, or are just a website with a wrapper around them. Um, and this was one that's like really beautifully designed, uh, and fun to play with. And, and, uh, if you're looking for a game to learn, it's, it's worth your two ninety nine. No, I think I was sold immediately when you mentioned designing a grandpa, that's, <laughs> It's not a feature that you um, manage to get very often. So that sounds super interesting. Yeah. Um, have you got the full board as well? You said you got the physical copy too. Yeah. Yeah. We still have that on, on loan from our neighbors. Um, so That's cool. Have you found you've been doing more stuff like that since being inside? I, I like the idea that people are going back a little bit and doing something that's more physical and less digital occasionally. Like mm-hmm. I'm doing a lot of digital stuff still and it's always been such a big part of my life but i think it's nice to break away from that if possible absolutely yeah we actually um yeah, we actually kind of are testing a uh every wednesday night we do a, a no screens night um and so we do a, a lot of different idea. like card games uh cribbage um i bought a i bought a guitar during quarantine that i've been teaching myself to play yeah um, so yeah we just try and like especially with working from home it's a lot easier to you know, I wake up and I kind of sign on. And then if people, any of my team pings me questions throughout the day, I effectively might be on online and connected to work, you know, for, for much longer than an eight hour day sometimes. Um, so it's nice to occasionally like set that little bit of a boundary and, and disconnect a bit. Yeah, that sounds great. What guitar did you get? Um, it is a Yamaha something that was recommended highly on Reddit. Uh, awesome. Uh, an acoustic? Yes. Yeah, that sounds good, man. Good luck. I like I like Thank this you. whole topic of um, physical time too, actually. So I'm kind of going to just impromptu throw in another pick um, because I've been trying to do things that are like less screen time uh, and more physical as well. And for me, um, I mean, you guys have probably heard of Magic the Gathering. Um, yes. So I, yeah, mm-hmm. I've been I've been back into that a little bit, but specifically. Um, I really like these things that you can buy online. They're called dual decks. And basically, um, it's like, usually it's like about 20 bucks. You can order them on Amazon. You get two full Magic the Gathering decks and they're balanced against each other. So they're pre-built decks, but like they're literally designed like usually with interesting mechanics that like play off the other deck very interestingly. So you can find some cool ones. And um, and because like, I'm busy these days. Magic's a ton of fun, but like I don't have time to sit and like figure out what the deck metas are, sit and like build something. And then like the one person you play with like ends up having like a really overpowered deck and you're just like, I don't want to play anymore. So um, I like this because it keeps it fair and interesting. So I'll toss that in too. I miss card games. I used to play so much when I was a kid, but um, then I got a mobile phone and now I don't need to. 
Yeah, I'm constantly on a screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very true. All right. Well, Michael, thank you for joining us. Uh, if our listeners want to keep in touch with you, obviously they can go subscribe to React Native now, um, but where else can our listeners uh, keep up with you? Sure. Um, yeah, they can connect with me on um, Twitter. It's probably the easiest way. Um, my handle is uh, LFKWTZ. Um, my last name's already hard enough, so I decided to drop the vowels to make it even more difficult. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and James, thanks for coming on too as a, as a host. Been a pleasure. Um, where can people find more about you? Uh, you could probably get me on Twitter. My uh, Twitter handle's at SternJobName. Great. And listeners, if you want to keep up with me, it's Tim Jung Dev uh, on Twitter as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you everyone for coming on today. And thanks listeners for tuning in. See you next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more.